All right, all right, all right, gang. Welcome back. As always, you're joined by your boy, Heavy Days, here from the Upside Down Library. And on this one, we want to give a massive shout out to our incredible sponsors who helped make the show happen, as always. Seeds here now, your number one seed bank in the industry, a guarantee not just on germination, on satisfaction, meaning at the end of the growth, if you're not happy, hit them up. They'll send you something to make it right. The reason why they offer this is because they only stock the highest quality breeders in the game. That's how they know you're going to be stoked at the end of a grow. Don't just worry about wasting your money. Worry about wasting your time. A guarantee on satisfaction means you don't need to be worried about this. A massive shout out to Copet Biological. These guys are the world leaders in sustainable biocontrol solutions to crop pests and diseases. If you're battling spider mites, check out Copet's new Spidex Vital Plus sachets. These are new Persimilis breeding sachets that release predator mites into your crop continually over a period of several weeks, providing sustained spider mite control. Now you don't have to spread carrier material into your garden just to introduce some predator mites. Just hang the sachets in the crop, let the Persimilis walk out and do the work for you. Trust me guys, you don't have to go up against a spider mite infestation without Spidex Vital Plus. These are truly the best predators on the market, the best in the game. I promise you try it once, you'll see the quality. Pulse sensors, you know them, you love them. You've probably already got a pulse unit in your garden. Why? Because it helps you track all of the hidden variables that you may not be consciously thinking about on the day-to-day level. And through fine-tuning these parameters, you can get a bigger yield. More turps, more flavor, more resin, more potency. God, what can't it do? Whether you're thinking of running a single tent, a single room, a multi-state operation, it's time to get serious, guys. Get yourself a Pulse Sensor. It's a no-brainer. And given they've just recently introduced the Pulse Hub, no better time to get on board to be able to fully integrate all of your units into one central localized hub. Massive shout out to Pulse Sensors. We love and appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. Massive shout out to our friends at Organics Alive, helping the homies grow the highest quality product worldwide. If you want a powdered, simple, organic fertilizer option, Organics Alive is the one for you. People have been sweeping competitions all around America using Organics Alive because their products are superior. If you want an easy to use, all-in-one, versatile option that has a range of different products to help any situation, including bloom, veg, transition, micronutrients, microbes, Organics Alive has everything you need. They're going to help you take your next crop to the next level. Check them out, guys. Quick release because they're fine powders, all organic. What more could you ask for? Huge shout out to our friends at Organics Alive. We really appreciate you guys getting on board. Please, everyone, go check them out. And a massive shout out to our newest sponsors, Dynavap. I'm sure you guys have heard me talking about Dynavap. They are an incredible vape company based out of USA, producing some of the most coolest engineering and vape technology you've seen for a while. These guys honestly help me get off bongs and transition to vaping. I cannot speak highly enough about Dynavap's products. Huge shout out guys, go check them out. And on this episode today, we have the Humboldt hero, the head honcho of Pirates of the Emerald Triangle, the strain historian and breeder extraordinaire. A massive welcome and thank you to Caleb of CSI Humboldt. Here to talk all things breeding. His recent work with the F1 Durban. Upcoming projects. How he's able to make all the incredible lines he does. And so, so much more. Without further delay, let's get into it. Alrighty, gang. You know what time it is. Big shout out for joining us today. And we have a special one, an old friend, a man whose work output is simply unbelievable, both in terms of volume and quality. A massive shout out to the Mendocino Pirate himself, Caleb of CSI. Thanks for joining us. Or the Humboldt Pirate, either or. (laughs) <laughs> the real Jack Sparrow. <laughs> How you been since we last spoke? 
Oh, uh, just staying busy as always. I don't think anyone can deny that. What have you been working on recently? Um, I mean, I've been doing a lot of uh, reproducing of of uh, all the original lines I reproduced. You know, seven, eight, nine, ten years ago. Um, as far as the the regular pirate stuff, and then just keeping busy, uh, trying to make you know a whole catalog of you know s ones for preservation and you know some hybrids for fun you know a bit of everything i love that a man of all tastes so let's let's touch on both the most recent regular line you've done if i'm not mistaken is that the dc hybrid or or do you consider that still in progress um oh i uh reproduced the dc uh reproduced the pine tar kush or not the pine tar the christmas Pine tar is actually coming up soon. Um, and then uh, the Burmese. Uh, I think the Burmese is mm, one I, I don't know. It's, it's one, one of the most uh, um, difficult ones, you know, because sativas are not easy. Um, pure sativas. Uh, and then, uh, then I, uh, I have uh, Panama on deck. So, you know. Wow. Are you starting to tap into your sativa side of things? Oh, yeah. Well, I've always had it. It's just, and they're a pain, <laughs> you know. Any, any of these, uh, you know, pure, pure sativas that take 20, 24 weeks, they don't even start flowering for six weeks. You know, <laughs> I mean, come on. You don't have a seed set until eight weeks deep. Yeah, I was about to say, I saw the photos of the, I think it was the Burmese you posted up and I mm -hmm. it could have been week two in my garden, but I think you said it was week six or seven or eight, maybe. Yeah, I was, it was probably close to eight. Yeah, yeah. Wow. What's that Burmese like and where did it come from? So the Burmese, uh, I, repro I reproduced that, oh, I don't know, maybe eight or nine years ago, something like that. I forget. Um, but, uh. Um, the, the seeds my buddy had been given were from the late nineties and they had sat in his fridge forever and he passed them to me. There was like 70 seeds or something. Um, and he had gotten them, um, from, you know, through the grapevine from this dude, uh, who went by the handle preservation dude or Colonel, Colonel cosmic, I think. Um, but this dude was, you know really well known around like you know central california the bay area um and you know he preserved a lot of stuff and so i don't know exactly how far back they date before him but they're at least you know mid 90s if not you know he probably had them for quite a while you know but he he passed on oof probably damn near 20 years ago maybe 15 but you know it's been a while yeah, wow. And you mentioned it's like one of those like really, really long flowering sativas. What what do you think you could compare it to? Like is it is the effect and the smell like not dissimilar to other plants that go that long? Or is like how would you describe it for someone, I guess? It's definitely like a Thai plant, you know. Wow. It, it's a it's an old school Thai type of plant. Mm-hmm. Damn. And and do, does it have that same sort of effect, like real uplifting? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It's 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 right in line with all that kind of stuff for sure. Oh, that's beautiful. We actually had a fan submit a question, and they said they were thinking about pulling the trigger on the Burmese, and they wanted to ask you how many packs do you think they should run through to find like what you would consider one of the better plants. I mean, you know, <laughs> I'm not gonna go all Tom Hill and say you need a hundred, <laughs> but. <laughs> I, I I'd say, you know, um, uh, just my personal recommendation, just, just do one and then, you know, give it a try. And cause they're, they're not easy to grow, uh, just by themselves. <laughs> you know, I mean, especially if you haven't grown sativas before, I mean, you, you can flower out a little six inch sativa and end up with an eight foot tall plant, you know, <laughs> <laughs> before it even starts putting flowers on 
you know. Totally, totally. Maybe just, yeah, maybe just get over the initial hurdle before we go to Tom Hill on it. That makes sense for sure. <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I guess as a follow-up, I'd be interested in general when you offer your preservation lines. I love how you do like 21 seeds or more in a pack. Mm-hmm. Is that because right. you are trying to encourage people to like do a little digging or is it just because you get more seeds or something like that? So, you know, I was I was a member of, you know, plenty of these like preservation groups, you know, land race groups, you know, online for years. And you always would see people sprouting four seeds or 10 seeds. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I mean, hell, honestly, I'd, I'd like to, you know, just do hundred packs, you know, minimum hundred packs. But the reality is not everybody has the space or the time to do a hundred at a time. So I do 21 because I'm like, well, at least make your selection from, you know, a bigger amount, or if you're going to open pollinate, you know, do it from a bigger amount, you know, and I know, I know a hundred's not perfect, you know, a thousand's better, but you know, I mean, yeah. you know, we're just trying to pre- preserve as many of the genes as possible for future generations, essentially, you know? Yeah. Hugely, hugely. And I, I can definitely get on board with the sentiment of, you know, you see people doing three or four seed open polls and you're like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know. Uh, that'll that'll definitely narrow it down to <laughs> what you want or don't want. <laughs> that's it. That's it, right? Okay. I mean, while you mentioned the Burmese, you know, it's like a Thai type plan, and we just quickly touched on Tom. I'd love to ask: Would you have any interest in running Tom's Hayes? Um, I mean, I think Tom's doing a pretty damn good job with with that. You know, I'd really like to, you, you know, see him after he gets his open pollination his most recent open pollination done, I'd like to see him actually get in there and, you know, directionally go somewhere with it and get that ratio of one in a hundred, you know, maybe a little, little lower, one in 10. That'd be nice. <laughs> <laughs> I would be appreciative. I, I'm looking for that mythical Hayes clone and I just sadly don't have enough right. space. <laughs> yeah. 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 But uh, I, I listened to your interview with him and I really liked it. And I, I, I related a lot because uh, it seems, you know, Tom and I, we, we've always tended to preserve, but we've, we've never done a whole lot on like directionally just narrowing it down and, you know, making something that's just, you know, you know, really high quality out of the things we've preserved, you know, we're always on to the next thing, you know, so, eh, you know, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm trying to take notes. <laughs> oh, you're too kind. Thanks for for listening to that one. And and look, you know what? I th- I feel like you touched on a really focal feeling that a lot of growers have, which I try to relate to people. And I say sometimes as you're getting towards the end of a project or like a harvest or whatever, you're almost mm-hmm. like checked out of those plants, and you're more invested in like mm-hmm. what's about to cut. You're like, I'm about to flip these other <laughs> things. They're going to be bomb. <laughs> oh, especially if it's 24 weeks later. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, where'd the year go? <laughs> <laughs> wow. So yeah. <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. Okay. I mean, and you know, we're talking about Tom. You did you did the deep chunk project. Any any interesting yeah. takeaways or observations you made while doing that one? Um, I definitely found some some uh some plants I didn't really um you know I hadn't noticed before in previous reproductions. Um, I think I just, you know, in my old age, I'm paying more attention, moving a little slower, you know, and there, there was some, there were some, uh, some sniffs that I wasn't expecting just, you know, a little, little skunky to them. And I was like, Hmm, you know, I don't know. It, it, it could blend well with some things. That's exciting to hear. I, I would love to ask you specifically, I know you've been posting some really impressive looking photos of some deep chunk males you've been playing around with. I think you've narrowed them down a little bit. Were there any specific traits or things you were looking for with that selection or how did you whittle them down? I was looking for stinky ones and, you know, of course, frosty ones, you know. I mean, I I, I asked Tom, you know, (laughs) what do you go for in those males? And he was like, I like the frosty ones. So, you know... (laughs) you know i was i was you know making sure i got those ones 
Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And do you think that like people are, are keen for the deep chunk or do you think that it's sort of a, a bit difficult for a lot of people to grow? Oh, yeah. I mean, in its own its own regard, it's, it's just as difficult as like, you know, the sativas. You know, it's a short, stumpy, super slow growing, you know, inbred, inbred indica, you know. And I mean, anytime you get anything inbred, you know, whether it's indica or sativa, eh, you know, it's not, they're not the easiest to grow, you know, mm. so. Certainly. And and how would you like compare and contrast it to say the Mazar line? Because I've been eyeing that one off and I'm like, ooh, I kind of think uh-huh. I want to run the Mazar. How are they different? How are they the same? Um, The Mazar, it tends to like, grow a little, little, little faster or a bit faster, really have, have more distance between the nodes and more be like a, a traditional type of just um, kind of like a Hindu Kush type of thing. Um, that definitely, uh, you know, not the monster, you know, fan leaves of the deep chunk and the super stoutness and all that, you know, it's, it's more of a regular Indica, type versus deep deep chunks yeah super <laughs> super indica i don't know yeah no i definitely get yeah I, I can understand that um i can't remember who it was but someone was on the show and they were saying that like the afghani sort of archetypal structure and flavors and effects that people in say america and, and all over the world think of is sort of a mazar type plant mm-hmm. would you say you agree yeah. with that in general yeah i think so i think so uh it, it's definitely you know uh, more of the norm type you know afghani indica type plant um there were there was even a a, a couple of them in there when i reproduced them last um that uh uh, we're a little bit reminiscent of say like a Bubba Kush, you know, you know, wow. not, not Bubba for sure, you know, but definitely, you know, and you see that a lot with, you know, some of the, you know, Hindu Kush, you know, um, a- Afghani Indicas and all that, you know, you know, that, that look of a plant. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. nice. And and I mean, like, if we're talking about, say, the Mazar or the Deep Chunk or really any of the lines we've touched on so far, mm-hmm. have you found any, like, really standout keepers or are you more just looking to open pollinate and you're not looking to find a keeper per se? Oh, we, there's definitely been, been ones that, you know, if I had more time, more space, more help, <laughs> I'd definitely, you know, be keeping some of these. I'm terrible at keeping stuff. Like, I'll keep them for, I don't know, two months, six months. And then it's just like, you know, my, my mother rooms are already overflowing. I, I got to make decisions. And if I have seeds, you know, I, I tend to let, let a lot of these keepers go. So, yeah. No, it makes sense. And you sort of touched on a question I wanted to ask you, which is that I can't count how many breeders have just like offhandedly made the comment being like, God damn, the amount of work Caleb does is insane. <laughs> I, I wanted to ask, how do you do it with just on your own? Because I know you don't have a ton of help. Like how many sites you got? How do you, how do you like get sleep? <laughs> I do have a very small crew of dedicated helpers. Um, you know, I've, I've got, I'd say three, three helpers that, you know, put in some serious time and, uh, you know, uh, I run five right now. I, I downscaled it a couple of years ago, but I run five um, breeding rooms, um, two regs and three fems. Um, and, uh, you know, I try to stay up on it. I, I do pretty good most of the time. Yeah, truly. It, it, it really is honestly inspiring to see how much work you put out. And, you know, because I feel like sometimes it's easy to drag your feet on projects and to like, you know, just dick around. And there have been times in my life where I've been more productive than maybe I am currently. And then I, I look at you and I'm like, damn, that's that's honestly the goal. <laughs> right, right. Uh, it would be nice if, you know, I only had w- one or two projects that that kind of sounds good to me lately. We need to crowdfund some help so you can go on a holiday. <laughs> I, 
I, I really want to, I, I really want to head to Australia one of these days. Oh, uh, look, I would love to have you here. And let me tell you, there's a lot of really nice CSI cuts floating around Australia. Like the one that jumps to mind immediately is mm-hmm. I know that there's a really nice lemon tree headband cut mm-hmm. that my buddy found. And, oh my God, beautiful all day, every day smoke. Oh, I bet. I bet. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of that lemon tree. Yes. And the headband. <laughs> well, before we get there, I want to quickly ask, because we've sort of been talking about some of the older projects you've been doing. Mm-hmm. Can you give me any insights on the Uzbekistan line? So that, um, that came from Charlie Garcia. Um, and um, that was from the original seeds he reproduced before he out crossed it to the northern lights um and um i got those uh or or we got those um i think through bodhi um so charlie had given them to um the, the, the this one cat who had then given them to bodhi and then i ended up getting them from bodhi and reproducing them gave a bunch to bodhi gave a bunch to charlie you know um but it's just a, it's another old school, you know, indica, um, kind of a leggier indica plant, but just super, super frosty hash plant style. Like, like when, when, when you hear people talk about hash plant and then you get these hash plant clones that have no frost, it's like, why are you calling them a hash plant? But the Uzbeki, you could call it a hash plant because it's a frosty hash plant. So, you know, but yeah. That that's awesome. It's definitely one of the more rarer ones, I think, and so it definitely has a bit of allure to it. It almost like touches on that same interesting vibe when people see Bodhi's ancient OG and they're like, "Ooh, Iranian! That sounds intriguing." Mm-hmm. It's like from a part of the world that you just never hear from, you know? Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Well, the last sort of mutant one I was hoping to quickly touch on because I know you've got a bit of experience with it is over the past few years, you've um, done slash collabed on some cool um, Australian bastard cannabis stuff. What What's that experience been like? Has that changed your outlook on things at all? You, you know, uh, I, I, I did a lot of work with it for a few years there. And... Um, it actually, it taught me a lot. It taught me more about breeding than anything. Um, in the fact that, um, basically anything ABC is going to be in a recessive genetic and you can breed, you know, these recessives on every, everything, you know, you, you grow out a hundred, you know, F1, F2, F3, um, and you can breed those recessives, but at the end of the day, uh, most of those recessives aren't, aren't the best uh, plants, you know. And ABC is a tough one. I mean, the only the only one I've ever seen that, you know, really looks like a halfway decent plant is, you know, um, you know, homeboy over in your neck of the woods. You know who I'm talking about. I was going to give him a shout out, Bin Chicken. Shout out, Dooliga. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he has a... He has an ABC that looks like a damn normal plant, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, and there's a lot of, like, interesting genetics in there as well. Right. It's a hybrid of a hybrid of a hybrid. Yeah. So. Okay. And, like, I mean, as a follow-up, you made, like, a bunch of cool hybrids. I remember there was, like, a TK hybrid. There was a cheese hybrid. Mm-hmm. There, was a, there was a number mm-hmm. of them. I don't want to do a disservice by forgetting one or two, so we'll just cap it there. But did right. any of them end up doing what you hoped where like you got a lot of influence from that regular mother on the abc type plant or it was more harder than just doing the cross i mean so i i honestly think i chose wrong uh at least with the ones i did um i took a tk um you know times abc to f4 and i found in the f2 generation i found uh you know, a, a plant that um, was an OG Kush ABC plant, right? Um, but then when I bred it to the F3, you, you, you couldn't even find 
any of that OG Kush. You know, as far as Terps go, you could find the look, sure, but you couldn't. There, there. I didn't get any of the Terps. You know, so um, there's a few ways. You know, I could backtrack on that. Um, one of them would be uh, to uh, make a feminized. You know, with an OG Kush. You know, type and then breathe into it. the the problem with ABC is it's always been terpenaline dom like many 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 sativas and you know even indicas but it's hard breeding terpenaline out yeah i've often wondered why that is like it it is such a dominant gene isn't it i wonder if it's yeah. just maybe it was like one of the first terpenes to ever be expressed by cannabis and it's just so deep seeded in the genome or something right i mean uh... Back in back in the day, Hype, Hype told me, "Good luck breeding the terpenaline out of ABC," <laughs> and he worked with it for twenty years. So you know, that that's that's experience right there. Mm -hmm. Wow, that that's really cool to hear. It. it taught you so much. I, I I wouldn't have guessed, but then when you said it out loud, I was like, "Oh, I guess that that makes sense." Actually, right. I mean, don't get me wrong, though. I do like terpenaline. Um, I'm just not the hugest fan of smoking terpenaline. Like, I like the sniff, but, I mean, eh, the, it, the smoke just never hits. I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, before I forget, what is your favorite sort of terpene profile? Oh, I, I love uh, limonines, uh, pinenes, um, you know, even like lemon lose, uh, awesomenes, uh, any any of those just, I, I think, though, the, 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 the limonene and pinene are, probably pretty close to my favorites yeah beautiful i mean i guess you must love like the lemon lime ogs oh yeah 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 and the the lemon tree terps even skittles oof that, that, i mean you know <laughs> that's a whole nother topic <laughs> we're gonna get there don't worry i i wanted yeah, to yeah. i wanted to ask you so we've spoken about some of the regular projects you've been doing recently let's now oh, talk yeah. about the fem i know that the community is absolutely bursting at the seams to get their hands on these f1 durban hybrids you've been making right tell us a little bit about this one how did this project come about i mean uh you know, I've always kind of wanted to test theories <laughs> and, you know, see if certain claims are, you know, what they what they are. Um, I mean, you know, most folks know that, you know, Jigga, you know, claimed that, you know, uh, what uh, cherry pie was F1 Derb times Granddaddy Purple and then Girl Scouts was um, uh, Flo, Flo Rida OG times f1 derb now you know you got other folks like kenny powers being like nah uh, uh and then you got you know other cats like uh, s flux capacitor being like mm, yeah no <laughs> so you know you got a lot of these folks in the cookie fam you know who actually were more into the breeding side of things or accident side of things i don't know <laughs> um, saying we don't think so but you know uh it doesn't hurt to try out the F1 Derb uh, itself grows like Girl Scout cookies, but it doesn't smell like Girl Scout cookies. So that's very interesting. Yeah. What what does it smell like? Out of curiosity, on a stem rub, um, I I was hitting old uh, not so dog up and being like, the stem rub smells like a Mendo Purple hybrid. And S flux capacitor, he he was alluding, I think, I don't quote me, but he was alluding to, you know, that F wonder being a Mendo purple hybrid of sorts. You know, I don't I don't know, but that stem rub, it was just like because anybody who smelled Mendo purple on the stem rub, it is one of the most pungent, just ooh, we plants you've ever smelled in your life. And that F wonder has that same thing. But then it 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 produces kind of a a, a cookie ish kind of nugget, you know, a flower, um, and then that stem rub doesn't really translate so much to the flower, which you know it happens. Yeah, wow, that's that's so so interesting. And I mean, out of curiosity, 
does the F1 derb, does it smoke just like a regular derb? What What's it like on its own? Okay. Um, I'm mostly familiar with uh, the uh, the this cut that goes around Colorado, Oregon, California yeah. as derb and poison. And it's just a, a super strong, it, it tests at like 5% or 4.5% uh, pure terpenaline. <laughs> and so the F1 derb, I, I don't smell any terpenaline in it, you know? So, but then, uh, you know, there might be a- aspects of like uh, black licorice anise to it, which, you know, uh, most people associate that with Durban poison, you know, the original old school Durban poison. Um, but Mendo purple, like, especially in the S ones, there's all kinds of black licorice and anise in that stuff. So I associate it more with, the Mendo purple, whereas other people might associate it with, you know, an old school Durban poison. Yes. Okay. Okay. This is all very interesting because it all, it, it definitely checks out in your head because the Mendo perp structure is also probably not too different to a cookie structure in a sense. It's a, it's a lanky indica type. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, you mentioned earlier that there's long been these speculations uh, from uh, from Powers Up, uh, Jigger, you know, mm-hmm. Cherry Pie has F1 Derb in it and GDP. Do you have any thoughts on that? Do you think that's more likely or less likely than the cookies claim? Uh, man, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I could go either way, um, you know, on that, um, you know, maybe yes, maybe no, you know. Uh, I, I, I don't want to over speculate quite yet it, what it makes me think is if it was true he like Jigger would have had to have somehow been connected to like either their crew made GDP cherry pies cookie made it all and that's how he knows mm-hmm. or he was somehow tied into all of the crews that did it and they're all like oh yeah we all use this same clone like it does just even from a logistics point of view it's sort of a bit doubtful Right. I think a lot of it is just, you know, they had this plant, this plant, and this plant in the room, these plants herm, you know, and, you know, they got seeds out of it. And then when they grow them out, it's usually if you know your plants, you can, you, you can kind of tell, you know, what might have pollinated what, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that, that's what got me into feminized breeding, you know, 25 years ago you know a little herm in a room finding a seed in your sensi crop and being like "Ooh, growing that seed out that seed don't herm grow something fantastic like a little bit of this a little bit of that and it's like oh shoot you know these feminized seeds can't be as bad as some people say they is eh? you know truly truly so yeah. i mean i know you've done extensive work with the urkel have you had any change of mind? Do you think Urkel might still be in cookies or are you more now leaning to the Mendo perps as you've alluded to? I mean, if there's GDP in there at any step, you know, that's that's going to be, you know, Urkel right there. Um, I still think it has to have it there because there's the whole OG Kush breath thing. And anytime you double up on a, a cookie type genetic, like if you cross uh cookies with fritters or cookies with wedding cake or wedding cake with fritters you get these og kb the og kush breath uh you know girl scout cookie uh types and that's always a doubling up on the genetic it's the recessive trait coming back through in any form of an f2 and so it it's got to have that that urkel trait in there from from some way somewhere you know i mean because i haven't seen that 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 phenotype or genotype or whatever of plant you know on anything but you know urkel and girl scouts going forward you know yeah definitely i tend to agree that i mean i guess the question then is do you think we'll ever truly find out the lineage or do you think the best we'll get is what you're doing just making similar sorts of things and just seeing what the seeds produce i mean if the hybrids are similar or the same i mean uh you know i think 
I think we can find out, but you know, um, yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's worth trying. Yeah. I mean, well, I was going to ask, have you found that like the most popular line from the F1 hybrids you did with, sorry, the F1 Durban hybrids you did is the Flowrider F1 Derb, like people wanting to test it? Yeah, I, I think that's that's the one that <laughs> definitely yeah, holds the most potential. Yeah. Ooh la la! And I, have you have you popped any of those yourself so far? Or is it just too early days? Oh no no! Uh, uh, they're 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 in the ground now. <laughs> I should have known. <laughs> that's yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Cool, cool. Okay. Well, I mean, while we're on the topic of the Urkel, I wanted to ask, you know, have you got any Urkel projects in the future? Because I know that like, I mean, Urkel work in general is pretty interesting to me because I really like the plant. I like the effects, the the flavors, the smells. But you've also done a twist in that you've done like S2s. And I think that work is really quite novel among a lot of breeders. Do you plan to take right. it to S3s? What's, what's your thoughts on the S2s? Where are you at with the Urkel project overall? Um, so that, that ties into, you know, the whole ABC kind of recessive inbred, blah, blah, blah. Um, so when, 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 when you grow the Urkel S1s out, um, you get like 10% mutant, which is that OGKB type of plant. And then you get like, I don't know, 40 or 50% crap. <laughs> and then, then you get, you know, 20% that, you know, are, are pretty nice, decent representations. And then you get maybe 10% that's just like, Ooh, we, you know, these are high quality, you know, Urkel type plants. Now, when I took, uh, and, you know, made, uh, sister sister s2s where i took one sister and pollinated another sister with it i grew a bunch of different ones of those out and they were all phenomenal they were like 90 percent uh just excellent plants you got rid of all that nastiness that was in the urkel s1s unfortunately they grow half as half as slow or half as fast they grow twice as slow as urkel there we go and anybody who's grown urkel is like urkel is slow as shit and these things grow even more slower well rid of snail's pace at that point yeah but their their quality is through the roof you know and so it's just like as as a standalone they're they're you can't give this to any you know it, it can't be grown commercially you know, so it's just like, well, the quality is super high, but the economics of it is super low. So it it, it would be great as an outcross um, to something, but not as just a, a, a standalone type of plant. That's perfect because I wanted to ask, you know, you've you've done a few remakes of lines you've done using mm. the update, like, you know, the Urkel S1 that you've selected over the original. When you do these right. revised crosses, do you find that you get significantly different results or it's just minorly different but maybe a little better in certain ways? They're, they're definitely different. Um, so, uh, like the 103 times Urkel, I've done it both ways. I've done... Uh, Urkel times 103 and then 103 times Urkel. Um, those plants don't have the, they're, they're like twice as big, you know, a twice as fast growing as the sister sister. So, you know, it's cause it has all the Urkel genetics and then, you know, um, you know, the, the S1, whereas the S1 S1, you know, it, it, it doesn't have all that wide. So those, those plants grew way better than, you know, than the S1 S1s, but their quality was way more variable as well. You know, they were higher quality than an S1 just by itself an Urkel S1, but you know, um, they weren't as high a quality as just the sister, sister S1s. Wow. Do you think that that sort of thing is what you're going to do going forward? Like looking to hunt through some S1s and then do those pairings? Yeah, no, that, that's, that's, that's my favorite part. That, that's why I make S1s, you know, 
I mean, you know, and, and eventually, you know, like, you know, breed them into S2s and then, and then hybridize, you know, this F S2 population with this S2 population, you know, and those, those plants, those plants can really be phenomenal if you make the right selections. That's really exciting to hear. I'm, I'm keen to see where it goes. You, you've touched on a deeper sort of point that I was hoping to ask you, which was that I was wondering, have you made any observations about the way traits are passed on when you fem one plant versus the other? Like, as you said, you reverse the 103 onto the original and you reverse the original onto the 103. Do you find that the act of reversing a plant and making it the pollen donor changes the way it passes on genes or it's largely the same? It seems like it's different. Um, so um, the main one I have uh, a, a example of that is I grew up. Um, let me make sure I got this right. I grew up, I think, a hundred of um, Mendo Purple times Urkel, and the Mendo Purple itself in S ones is extremely variable. You know. Um, flower wise smell wise i mean the plants you know all look almost the same but once they flower it, it's all over the map um now in the mendo purple times urkel it was like all kinds of different uh mendo purple type variations um but then i grew 20 24 25 out of the uh urkel times mendo purple and every single plant was an Urkel type plant, you know? Um, so it, it's almost like, you know, they, depending on if they're used as a male or female, they push different things forward. You know, I don't know. Uh, I, I still have a lot more experimentation to go on all that, but it definitely seems like, you know, you, you create different things um, depending on which one you reverse. Uh, you know, and I remember in the past, I, I can't remember if it was Subcool or someone used to say, you know, whatever's the pollen donor is going to impart like structure and potency. Do you think it's as clear cut as that, or do you think it's like it's more variable and it just it might vary? I think it's real variable, especially. I think it really depends on you know, you know what your pollen donor is and how much you know stuff is in that. Um, you know, I, I, uh, had Phylos run a, a bunch of stuff, you know, over the years, you know, for better or worse. And, um, a lot of their data is, yeah, not factual. Um, but my main thing for doing, doing that, um, having things tested is I really want to know what the, you know, um, what the stability is, what the, um, you know, I'm having a brain fart on the, the words. I ain't a scientist. <laughs> um, you know, w whenever you get into an S1, S2 population, you know, everything becomes more and more stable. And so it really depends on what you're using as your male, um, how, how it passes forward, I think, you know. On, on that topic, I mean, it was one of the fan submitted questions. People were wondering, you know, obviously the phylos, the way it all played out and the fallout from it left a lot of people quite skeptical of genomic companies and data collection companies, the like. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's any companies that are currently around that you would trust with it or you're just not really engaging in that sort of thing at the moment? I haven't uh, entertained it too much just because... Um you know, uh, Phyllis kind of left a sour taste in my mouth and I don't, I don't know if any of these other, um, you know, companies can do what we want them to do, or if it's just going to be more of the same Phyllis type of blah, 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 you know? Yeah. I think that's a pretty understandable approach. A few questions ago, you, you when you were talking about the Urkels being really slow growing and like not mm -hmm. not good commercial picks at all, I did want to ask you: out of the seeds you offer, what are your top three recommendations for someone who maybe has a facility or a bigger space they're working with 
and they're like, I want to run your stuff. But, you know, it does need to lend itself a little bit towards the things that a commercial operation would need, you know, maybe a little better yielding and maybe some good terps. What are maybe some things you might recommend for those folk? Oh, usually anything in the like uh, T1000, uh, you know, catalog, those, you know, were really good when, you know, I ran them. Um, You know, I, I like the Chem D hybrids, you know, they make really high quality you know, plants and big yielders, you know, stuff that, you know, people can, you know, get potency and yield because that's, that's another thing too. Uh, when, when you're doing commercial, you need, you know, yields and you need high tests because everybody's obsessed with, you know, something that yeah, it's got to be 30, 35% testing, you know, none of the dispensaries, you know, are going to pay money for something that don't test high. Yeah, it's a sad truth, right? I feel like, you know, the real hardcore cannabis community, the the sort of the space that we exist in, so to speak, like generally speaking, I just say anyone who's listening to this show, you're probably like in the top 0.1% of passionate about because like who else would sit here and listen for hours about this stuff? And yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I feel yeah. like our community is starting to accept very much that like, you know, the Chem 91, you know, maybe it tests like 18, 19%, but it's it's good smoke, mm-hmm. you know. Do you think we'd ever get there commercially where we get more of a general education among the public or do you think the numbers will still dominate? They, It needs to get to a point where the numbers don't mean, you know, uh, anything. Because re- realistically, if you think about it, the numbers are an, an equation. You know, every plant or most plants have like a ceiling, right? And, you know, if you take one puff, you know, two puff, three puff, you know, you keep going up. Well, some plants might have a ceiling of two, two puffs, whereas another 10, another 100, you know. And so, you know, something with 18 percent, 10 puffs deep, you're like, whoa, I shouldn't have taken those last three. You know, whereas, you know, something with a ceiling of like, you know, three or four puffs, uh, you can't get higher. So it's just like you know, that 30%, you know, ain't, ain't really doing you much, much favors when you can't get higher than that three or four puffs. So, you know. Have you got any thoughts on what it is that actually contributes to the ceiling effect? I think I, I re-listened to the DJ short episode not long ago and he said, oh, I think that maybe there's like a tiny bit of CBD in the background or something. It just sort of like limits how high you can get. I'd be interested to hear. Do you have any thoughts on what might be that ceiling we talk about? Oh, I don't know if I think that deep. <laughs> good smoke's uh, good smoke. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm a, I'm a pretty simple feller, you know. If it sniffs good, you know, and that does the trick, you know, <laughs> I'm okay. That works for me as well. I mean, on that topic, have you got any plants or crosses that you would recommend to people if they are looking for something that has a higher ceiling? Because I actually get a lot of messages from people who are probably only used to the more modern stuff and they're like, I don't really get what people mean by this ceiling thing. Right, right. I mean, I swear the the, the chems, uh, you know, the whole chem family, you know, tends to do really well. And like you mentioned about that Chem 91, um, you know, it generally does only test around like 18, 19%, you know, every time we have it tested. And yet it will, in hybrids, it will almost double a lot of, you know, if you cross it with something weak, it almost doubles the, you know, the numbers with whatever you cross it to. So, you know, I mean, Chem 91's not, even remotely my favorite as a standalone but just what it can do you know in hybrids and everything you know know, there's no arguing it's it's an excellent plant ideally you know more so for breeding let's let's go down this path because i got a few questions about the chem i'd love to ask you And, and the first one is what is your personal favorite of the chem 91 hybrids you've done Oof. um i've had a few i've had a few uh, I, I definitely smoked all of, uh, all of this, uh, select plant of, uh, uh, sour diesel times, uh, chem 91. That thing was amazing. Um, and then there was, there was just a regular old chem 91 times girl scouts that I smoked all that one too. 
<laughs> that was really good. Um, so, um, I don't, I don't know how many I've grown in, in the last year or two. Oh, uh, no, no, there, I, I grew a few, but they were like triple hybrids. I think they were, uh, chem 91 times girl scouts crossed with, you know, like ruthless runts and, uh, you know, some of these other things. Um, and you know, the, the, those all came out really, really nice as well. So, yeah. That's interesting. I, I was talking to Not So Dog recently, and he he mentioned that you and him were talking about it, and you'd said, you know, the chem it just really passes on potency quite consistently. When I heard that, I started thinking, do you view it in that sense as essentially a breeding tool more than like its own unique thing, or how do you use it in breeding projects? Oh, definitely, definitely. I mean, you know, it, it's definitely a tool to to increase potency and you know, all that. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and most recently you've done the really interesting and novel chem 91 hybrids. I think a lot of people super interested in them. Um, mm -hmm. for the chem one, how would you describe it to people? What's its effect? Like, what's it like as a plant? So chem one, um, it, it, it tests, you know, on par with, you know, uh, a lot of the other chems, uh, roughly usually around 20%. Um, but, uh, it, uh, it tested like 5% terpenes and, um, the bulk of that is all myrcene. It's like one of the highest, just, you know, pure myrcene plants that, you know, have in the catalog. Um, it's like a, oh, I don't know, 11 or 12 week type of plant. And she's pretty ugly, you know, by, you know, today's standards, you know, I mean, everybody wants that pretty, pretty looking, you know, flower, but she, she's an ugly girl and she kind of tends to pass that ugly on, Oh no, <laughs> you know, but you know, I mean, uh, it, that's a tough one as, especially today, everybody loves Girl Scout cookies and all the poly hybrids, you know, with that, they like them cause they're pretty, but you know, half the time and, if you like smoking cardboard, they're all right too. <laughs> you know that is a common turp profile. We've seen a lot of hype strains. The old cardboard. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, while we're talking about the Chem One, I think as time's gone by, I've been able to appreciate more that it. Because to me, I always thought the Chem One it was just out in the field on its own. And then the more I look at photos of, say, the Chem 4, I'm like, actually, I can see a lot of relation here. The question right, is, right. do you think it's from the same seed stock as the Chem D and the Chem 91, or do you think it just has to be different? Okay, so, you know, you you, you might, you know, uh, get different information from different people's you interviews. <laughs> but uh, I, I still uh, stand strong on the fact that I think uh, chem 91 was the only you know seed that was really kept from i mean there was the original chem sister from 91 and i think she was kept for a while too um but for the most part it was the 91 that was kept and i think the d is a hybrid with the 91 and then i think the one through four are all the same hybrid or not the same hybrid as the chem d but all you know um a hybrid of 91 because you know i got those those uh i got clones of those from joe brand seed plants you know of the one through four and they, they they were almost identical sisters you know but then their flowers you know segregate out and they they look a lot you know different you know to each other the number three was like the 91 but bigger chunkier better better plant um but it was like you know, a match on the, the, you know, the, the look and the smell and all that. Um, the four was like amazing compared to all of them, except for the fact that, you know, it was, it was kind of terrible, you know, three or four weeks after you harvested it. Cause it just went Brown. Yeah. I, I've heard that a bit. I mean, I'd be curious to ask, you know, I'm sure we're going to do a lot of questions about this, but like, the Chem 1 and the Chem 4, visually at least, have always struck me as looking like there's like an NL5 haze in the mix. What do you suspect yeah. the pollen donor onto the Chem 91 might have been to make those? 
I, I think somewhere in that realm, you know, it definitely something, something sensey. And, you know, the, I, the, the, the question I've always had is, you know, um, it, for, for, for Greg, you know, uh, chem dog, Greg, um, is, uh, what was he growing in the rooms? Cause I know he only had chem 91 in, for maybe four or five years at best before he lost it. Right. And so what was in his rooms, you know, during those years where something might've hermed and, you know, that's where he would have gotten those seeds. He swears they came from that same original seed batch, but it's highly unlikely. You know, I don't, I don't believe it, you know, but you know, that better question is what was in his rooms at those times. And he's posted what, you know, over the years, what was, but you know, uh, I think some of the posts uh, from like Planet Ganja and IC Mag aren't aren't there anymore. You know, Planet Ganja has gone and IC Mag, you know, he deleted his account, I'm sure. And so a lot of his posts that weren't like, you know, you know, copied and, you know, um, blah, blah, blah are gone, you know. And it's hard for most people to find out who said what, you know, because it's just going to say guest, you know, and uh you know, somebody like me who was there is like, I know who that guest was, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Okay. So. so, I mean, the follow-up, you sort of alluded to it, but I just wanted to nail down on it. You know, there was a lot of focal discussion recently when Matt put up a post saying that, you know, he suspects the Chem D is the 91 by Super Skunk. Is mm-hmm. that the lineage you think is what's behind the D? It could be. It could be. Um or, uh, I mean, uh, I've, I've always almost thought, uh, you know, it could be like maybe a Shiva skunk. Cause I swear, I swear, I swear Greg was growing some Shiva skunk back then, but you know, it, it, it could have been any of those types, you know? Yeah. Oh, the Shiva almost se- feels right. You know? Mm. I don't know. Yeah, uh, now that you say it, it, I I do get what you mean. A bit of that skunk influence in there as well, like the the not the uh, Virginia super skunk, but just the sensi skunk. Right, right, right. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. No, that that certainly makes sense. And then, so look, we as, as I did when I was chatting to not so, we, we've spoken about the one and the four, the D. The question has to be asked: Any ideas mm-hmm. on the ninety ones lineage then? I mean, for one, I think the just by, you know, breeding with it, S1s predominantly, because, you know, I've grown out the better part of a couple hundred, you know, S1s with me and, you know, the homies. And it, it, it's so stable. I swear, you know, the S1s I've made, I, I think the Chem 91 itself is an S1. And so, you know, technically, I think, you know, what I made are probably S2s, you know, and then um, I think uh, whatever plant the Chem 91 came from, um, yeah, there's a, there's a little bit of debate on it. But uh, I, I, don't, I don't think some people are too wrong with the, the whole tie-in with hash plant. Yeah, well, that yeah. was what I was going to ask. Where do you feel Skelly fits in the picture? Because I, I really believe that the smell and the effect mm-hmm. are very similar. Right. But I will happily acknowledge that the structures are so different. I'm happy to entertain the debate that maybe they're not related. But right. it is it is a very uncanny resemblance in smell and effect, I've always thought. So, you know, I have, I have Skelly. Um, I also have HP13 they both have a similar look between each other, you know, not, not anywhere close to, you know, like identical, but you know, there's a lot of similarities between those two. And then those two kind of got me thinking, well, I grew hash plant one back in the day um, from the devil's harvest crew. And that plant has some very strong, uh, similarities to not only the, uh, the HP 13 and the, and the Skelly, but it almost looks more like the chem 91, you know, cause it has those dark, dark leaves. It has a similar leaf shape 
and it actually grows like a a bigger uh, Chem 91 outdoors um, than you know Chem 91 itself. So I don't know. I don't know. There 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 could be something to the whole hash plant, you know, theories. Yeah, totally. And I mean, you touched on the hash plant 13. I think it's one where people hear about it, but it's hard to get a lot of info about it. Mm -hmm. What's your thoughts on it? Is it, is it, because I I mean, I've I've only seen the plant in veg one time at Bob Hemphill's house and I was like, oh, this is a very thin leaf plant. And he was like, yeah. Um, what, what's your take on it? Um, I think it's a hash plant hybrid, you know, definitely retains a lot of, you know, the hash plant to it which you know anytime you have an indica sativa hybrid a lot of times those indicas can be dominant in the structure it seems you know um i've got a ton of experience going right now where i'm trying to go both ways you know indica sativa and then sativa times indica i i I just want to see how all those pan out with the you know using the different different ones for male and female but uh um the hp13 um you know, it, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to even speculate on that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I was going to say, you know, I think, uh, JJ has put up some posts talking about how he thinks there's like some Burmese and some stuff in there. Given your right. experience with the Burmese, have any thoughts on that speculation? Cause just based off what I'm hearing, it sounds like the Burmese is like maybe way too long flowering. Right. But you know the the right indica, you know it'll it'll shorten that flower time down pretty good, and uh, I don't think the HP thirteen is a a really quick flower. I mean, you know, maybe a ten weeker. Okay, know? yeah. So, yeah, um, you know, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. The, the, uh, some some of those terp profiles do kind of match up, you know, with that that sweetness of of the Burmese. It's definitely not doesn't remind me of like the indica type of terps yeah interesting interesting okay and then a nice little segue into the nl work you did was for the longest time people have speculated that like sort of the backbone of chem dog may have some nl in it now that you've done your nl work do you see that at all um if if there is any nl in it um I don't think it's going to be the five and the only, you know, one I've, I've run out was, is the five. Um, there were some similarities, uh, on, you know, uh, at least one plant specifically when I first ran them out to the old Northern lights I got from my dad back in 94. Um, but overall it, it was more of a, a, a different type of, you know, Northern light that you see in a lot of hybrids you know, out there. Um, I don't think, you know, I had the NL five, you know, back in the day, we just had it as Northern lights. So, you know, I'm not entirely sure, you know, what we had one, two, 10, I don't know. (laughs) And then like, what, what's your takeaway been from the project you've done with Matt and you know, the seeds from Greg McAllister, have you had any cool insights into that all? And, and tell us a little bit about what the NL seed line is like in general. Um, I mean, it, it's like a, you know, uh, the NL5, of course, is, you know, uh, essentially supposed to be a, a pure indica crossed with a Hawaiian sativa. Um, so um, it's definitely hash plant-esque, you know, um, you know, super frosty, you know, um, so, some of the plants lean towards that, um, you know, that Hawaiian type, um, you know, but, you know, most of them, most of them are just kind of like that, that Amsterdam thing, you know, that was wild and crazy all the way through the early mid nineties, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, def- definitely a throwback. That's for sure. You know, to those, mm. that era. And do you think it stands up to what a lot of people remember, or do you think there is an element of like rose shade glasses? Uh, I mean, as as much as I'm, you know, I I love preservation. You know, I mean, you 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 take all the you know the land races. Land races are not, you know, they're 
they're they're not great for a whole lot of things. You know, you can't grow a commercial. You know, the, uh, oftentimes they're they don't they're not great for standalone plants like you know headstash. You know, they're like building blocks, and it, it kind of feels like the NLs you know might be great for building blocks, but they they really don't stand up to you know the the designer weed of today yeah certainly i can understand that i mean as, as a follow on having had that experience with the nl5 is there a part of you that would be keen to grow out the purest indica if you had like good source um i mean uh M- matt uh matt riot uh he's he's got some of those seeds and he um uh, he tried to give them to me a few months back, and um, I think I got too lit and forgot them. <laughs> <laughs> I'll shoot but, him a know, message uh, and bump him. I like do it. <laughs> oh no, no, no! It's not on him at all. Shoot! <laughs> all I have to do is say yes, and yeah, we'll get to cracking. I don't, I don't know. Uh, you know, the 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 Pierce is a is an interesting one. Um, it it could be you know probably closer to the the Northern Lights that you know. I grew back in the, the mid nineties. Um, but, uh, I mean, I'd like to grow it. I got so ma- many things though on the plate. It's that, like, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to overload you. Uh, so, I mean, look, if you had to guess, what do you think the NL you were growing back in the nineties was, do you think it was maybe more like a one or something? That's my guess. That's always been, you know, kind of my hunch. Um, yeah. Cause I, I never, ever, from everything I've seen of the five, it definitely, you know, didn't seem like that was, that was the hybrid. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. And I mean, you know, to tie it on up, you, you also did the work with the Hawaiian lights, which was really cool. You know, how did that differ to the NL five and, and what sort of the general description you give for that one? They were extremely similar to the NL five, but there was just a ton of that, super you know sweet pineapple just fruity you know just hawaiian terps on a lot of those ones you know um there, there was like hints of that stuff in the uh in in the nl5 but it was it was almost prominent and dominant on on a lot of the ones in the hawaiian lights mm-hmm yeah wow wow and i know that you had selected keepers of the nl and the hawaiian Mm -hmm. you plan to breed with them going forward oh well you know (laughs) uh the mother room got a little full again (laughs) and uh i had to make some harsh decisions (laughs) so i i i have i think i have two two keepers held of the nl5 and then everything else um oh maybe i i might have kept one hawaiian light my my mother room is ridiculous so (laughs) sometimes i don't even know what's in there do i dare ask how many plants do you have in your mother room uh well let's not talk about that on tv (laughs) (laughs) too hot for tv i love it (laughs) (laughs) okay well look we, we did have a fan submitted question and they were wondering uh, they sort of reading into where we were going with this discussion. They were saying, you know, I can only imagine that maintaining a mother room the size you have is almost a full time job in itself. Do you have any tips or tricks for maintaining a big library? And as a further follow up, do you have any IPM tips? Because I can only imagine that's something you're having to keep on top of. Right, right. Um, I mean, <laughs> I'll admit right now. Um, I, I uh, um, try to do as minimal as I can just to keep everything alive. I try to grow things. I underfurt things a lot. Not so can vouch for this. Um, I underfurt things a lot just to slow them down so they don't grow fast. I, I give very, very limited nitrogen, you know, because otherwise, you know, they're always up in the lights if I don't, you know, <laughs> slow them down. As for IPM, uh my favorites are pyganic, spinosad, and uh, liquid sulfur. You know, that tends to you know keep most of the bugs, you know, that could potentially come through, you know, down and out. We we always have uh, the thrips flying in through the <laughs> through the open doors and you know that kind of good stuff. Definitely. 
there's always powdery mildew growing on everything outdoors so yeah i can only imagine up your neck of the woods because I, I think like a lot of people who have never been to mendocino or you know northern california in general probably mm-hmm. can't appreciate how what the climate is like there because it's only recently i've really like you're like it is really foggy in the mornings and most yeah. of the day like yeah. it's hard to appreciate yeah and i'm i'm pretty much entire most most entirely coastal based with all all my stuff uh i i still grow my you know six california you know personal legal plants uh you know out 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 in my place in the hills but you know that's a totally different environment out there you know it's 100 115 degrees you know all summer long out there um and you know a total total opposite of the coast wow i mean on that point what sort of plants would you run for yourself both from like things that you like but also that would do well in those conditions because it sounds pretty hot yeah um i mean uh one one of my old school favorites out there um that always really did well was old betsy you know and that's something that you know 90 percent of people are just like what (laughs) but you know people around this general area are like yeah old betsy's what's up you know so uh, she she was always a good one um my uh my uh bomb threat bubba um my bubba s1 selection she she actually does really well out there you know um for for whatever reason i've got one of her grown this year and uh, Irene, Irene tended to do pretty okay um, when I grew her. So I've got uh, an Irene uh, this year. Um, Kim D did good, and uh, um, you know she's a late one, but you know really good quality. So I, I broke down and put a Kim D out this year just for just for fun. <laughs> so and a few a few others I'm just trying out this year. That's a, a beautiful mixture. I would be mm-hmm. feeling very pleasured to smoke any of those strains. So I guess the question is, are we going to see you do hybrids with some of those ones, like a, a project maybe? with like Because I know you've pollinated old, old Betsy and some of the other ones you mentioned. Would you ever, and the Irene, would you consider doing a project like reversing Irene or reversing Betsy? So uh, I reversed Irene and um, I think I had a half – half a bed, half a light of Irene to pollinate. And I got 20 seeds. Oh no. Yeah. Uh, Irene was, um, like what I call a one percenter. Like she, like I got so few seeds on my, I re, uh, like a four light Irene reversal that I grew a, a bunch of them out immediately just to make sure it wasn't like pollen contamination or like something else harmed in the room. And they were all Irene plants. So I was like, yeah, yeah. Okay. Hey, but the the yeah it was the pollen was not very viable um and there wasn't much of it to begin with um and then betsy uh she produced zero pollen i i reversed her and nothing so I'm, I'm a little, yeah i'm a little sketched to do betsy again i don't know um but yeah 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 that's beautiful segue for me it's my favorite saying beautiful segue (laughs) because (laughs) we had a question about like failed reversals like one of the Mm -hmm. listeners is currently trying to reverse a chemdog d s1 they got from you they found like a nice one they Mm -hmm. really Mm -hmm. like and they're like for the life of me i i he's i've seen the photos he's reversed it two or three times he'll get the nanas but there's no pollen Mm -hmm. in them ever you got any tips or tricks for stubborn reversals I, I kind of wish I did, but it, it's, it's tough. And, you know, uh, it gets tougher in each generation. Um, like, you know, S ones, uh, you're going to have less plants that will actually, you know, give you viable pollen. Um, it, when you hit S twos, it's even fewer. Um, I've heard Sam, the skunk man say that once you hit S five, it, it's terminal. You, you don't, you don't go past S5, you know, but just seeing how plants do, you know, from the S1 to the S2, you know, I'm like, I don't know if I don't even want to deal with the S4 or 5 plant, <laughs> little shrubby little mutants. <laughs> wow. But 
I, I honestly, I, I don't have any tips for that because, uh, um, the, the, the few times I've made a bunch of selections, um, with S ones and I, I, I've gone through and I've sprayed all of these, uh, different S ones. Um, you know, I'll have some that produce lots of pollen, some that produce a little bit of pollen and then a lot that produced no pollen. So, you know, it, it, it's not easy. It's not easy. Sure. Sure. We had another question that was, it was very similar. Just talking about, you know, do you, do you change dilutions? Do you apply the spray more frequently? If it, if I'm interpreting this correctly, it sounds like you've just got to reverse a lot of plants and, and maybe one of them will work. Is that right? Uh, yeah, it, it can be like that too. Um, that, that's the thing too. Uh, um, I've, I've experimented a lot with, you know, different dilutions, uh, multiple, you know, frequency, you know, sprayings, uh, you know, this, that the other. Um, and uh, so uh, I've, I've mentioned this before. Um, generally, when I just reverse, you know, a, a plant, I'll, I'll take uh, like eight plants is my usual. And, you know, they'll be in like five gallon pots and they'll be, you know, nice two to three foot you know, plants, you know, around and tall. And, uh, oftentimes with, uh, some of these, you know, even moderate, you know, reversal plants, I'll only get out of eight, I'll only get like two that produce decent pollen. And then I'll have a couple put on, you know, midzy pollen. And then I'll have a bunch of them put on no pollen. So if you have somebody reversing just one plant or two plants, I mean, that, you know, you're, you're going to have, you can imagine, you know, there's, there's going to be like, you know, three, four, five fails, and then you might get one to kind of hit. And then another time you'll get one to really hit, you know, and that's off just the same exact plant, same dilution, same spraying, you know? So, I mean, I'm, I've, I've definitely done this a lot, but I, you know, I, I still can't, you know, tell you oh this is what works you know because it's so variable and what I, I mean my question is why can you spray eight plants with the same exact dilution same time same everything and yet you know two are great pollen two are midzy and four don't even give you pollen i'm i'm like uh i got questions too <laughs> <laughs> You know? Look, yeah, I have to acknowledge the first time I ever did a reversal, I think I got one of the midzy ones and uh-huh, uh-huh. and I thought that was like the baseline and uh, right. I, I, I'll acknowledge I've been caught out. The next time I did it, I got no pollen and I was like, what the fuck is going on? Right, right. <laughs> it happens to everyone. It's so variable. Uh-huh, uh-huh. It's like uh, it's like the chem dog. It's up to the stars. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So I wanted to ask you. You know, you have been doing these wicked grows in these planters. I think everyone should go look at your Instagram. You do like you know these really cool pheno hunts in the beds. Um, mm-hmm. really gorgeous looking plants. Can you give us a quick rundown of your style when you're doing that? Because I got to give you a shout out. I remember. First time I came to the Emerald Cup, I came and saw you at the booth, and uh, mm-hmm. you you were mentioning that um, the Girl Scout reversal you were trying to do it didn't work, so you ended up with all this sensi crop, and um, right. the cookies and the patient zero bud you gave me it was so memorable, and you were like, yeah, I grew it in like the the planters, and um, oh my god, so superior, really memorable stuff. How do you do it? What's the rundown? Uh, pretty basic. I just use like a, a, a cocoa peat blend, uh, you know, uh, around here it's called black gold, but you know, I'm, there's tons of different types. And then, uh, I just, uh, put in a bunch of, a uh, bunch of amendments. Um, I think my base is mostly fish, frass, insect frass, and, uh, um, you know, trace minerals and, uh, yeah, I've, I've got like 20 different organic <laughs> ingredients. I kind of, I try to give the plants a buffet of quick release, uh, medium release and slow release stuff. And then I try to just give them plain water for the duration that they're in, in those beds. Just super simple, you know? Um, yeah. 
Beautiful stuff. Beautiful stuff. I'd love to ask you. Normally, we, we start with this one, but uh, we've been a bit sidetracked having fun. What have you been smoking on recently? Oof. Um, I've still been smoking on a ton of like the um, uh, the Family Feud. Family Feud times... Uh, um, or wait. Yeah, Family Feud times like Ruthless Runts. Um, Family Feud times... Uh, Eh, the punch one was okay. Um, uh, the triangle Kush, uh, uh, Urkel one Oh three S ones. Um, those were really nice. Um, bunch of Z S ones, a bunch of Sherbert S ones. Um, basically, uh, <laughs> I, I, I did a, a pheno hunt, a handful of months back. And so I've had like 500 plants hanging, <laughs> and so we, we we go up and like just you know pull pull you know three or four you know samples every every night or two and then we'll smoke through you know the, the different ones um but uh yeah pretty much uh you know just been smoking on that last 500 seed run so uh, yeah just a bunch of bunch of stuff it's a tough job but someone's got to do it <laughs> that's right <laughs> that sounds amazing i mean a lot of questions to jump into there i I think the first one is do you feel like when you're testing that many phenotypes it it can almost become a bit more difficult to discern the clear winners because i'm sure at the end of a 500 seed pheno hunt you've got like 10 plants of the same variety and they're all really good like how do you how do you whittle them down or do you just end up with a few keepers it starts like that. Like it starts, you know, initially like it's, it's difficult, it seems. And it probably, you know, is the whole time, but um, eventually you, you start, you know, finding ones that really stand out. Right. And then, you know, you go back to those and you go back to those and then you get sad when there's no more of that plant left. Uh, we had a, 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 a Skittles uh, 85 S one and uh that one stood out and we kept trying to smoke all these other skittles s ones and it's just like eh, eh. and then we just cheaped through the whole z85 plant and now we have no more z85 we don't even want to smoke the others you know <laughs> you become spoiled yeah 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 but um i actually am uh trying uh I've, I've got a reversal going with that z85 right now and uh i'm, I'm not crossing my fingers too 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 much because uh, z is a hard one you know to reverse yeah interesting what's what is the 85 phenotype like uh well it it has like all the terps of of z and it's potent <laughs> wow because z itself ain't, ain't the strongest smoke in the shop um when it when uh when i uh um had uh um, had, uh, the ABCs tested, um, they came in pretty low <laughs> and Z came in 2% higher. <laughs> so ba bastard cannabis is almost as strong as Z. Wow. I never would, <laughs> I never would have thought that. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, you know, so, so when you've done this massive Skittles pheno hunt, what sort of insights have you gotten from that? Have you got any more ideas about what might be the lineage of it? Oh, uh, I, I think, well, for one, I think it's probably an S1. Uh, Z is an S1 to start with. Um, and then um, I'm pretty sure it's just some some type of like a Girl Scout cookie hybrid. Um, Girl Scout cookie OG type, you know, so, something along those lines. Um, it doesn't even have to be an OG type, but it, it could just be a Girl Scout cookie hybrid type. And the OG is, you know, you know, from the Girl Scouts. So. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, and then, you know, you, you sort of touched on it loosely. You did the Sherb S1 project. Did that help solidify any thoughts about the possible relationship? I mean, there was definitely some Z types in there for sure. Um, or Z leaners, let me put it this way. But um, I only ran 70 of them out 
I think it was 70. Only. And, yeah. <laughs> That's like more than anyone does. <laughs> but I, I, I didn't find a plant that was like that right there is Z, you know? So um, I did find one plant that was freaking amazing. And it was the best smelling plant out of 500 plants. Hurricane off of that seed run. Um, and on the Sherbert S1s, it was just absolutely amazing. And it was just one of those sure best ones, but it was amazing. And of course, you know, I went to the clone room and yep, that was the one that was dead. Oh, <laughs> heartbreaking. Yeah. So I kind of want to dip into the sure best ones again and run out at least a hundred or maybe even 200 and see if I can't find Z and that one. So. Interesting. Interesting. And I mean, from like a sort of a commercial point of view, what do you think, will be able to dethrone the Skittles Terps because it feels like for something to be really popular these days, it's got to be like gassy Skittles, purple. That's sort of the general combo. Do you think anything's going to help us break free of that mold? Uh, oof. Maybe maybe a, a new flavor, but just as, uh, just as pungent. Yeah, yeah. So just some, yeah, I guess it's almost ushered in this wave of like, it has to be insanely loud or it's just, it just can't stand up. Yeah. Yeah. Cause there's, there's tons of just average out there, you know, it, it just has to be something just really, really pungent and strong. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I mean, in that same lane of thought, Indicas are just absolutely dominating the market. And I know that there's a small but growing movement of people who are like, you know, we really need to show the general public that sativas have a lot to offer and it doesn't need to be like a pure tie, but, you know, Super Silver Haze did really well for a reason, right? Like it was sort of that middle ground. Right, right. Do you think that we'll ever get more traction with sativas and the general public or do you think that Indica is just too prevalent and when most people think of weed, they think of like getting a bit zoned out in your chair at the end of the day as opposed to like an uplifting energetic thing? Right, right. I mean, it should, it should become more prevalent. Um, you'd, you'd think more people would, would be entertaining it, you know, during the day and stuff. I don't know. Uh, it, it, it's just, uh, I don't know. Even the sativas that are available, they're just kind of so hybridized out, you know, I don't even know if you're, you're really getting that sativa sativa experience from you know uh a lot of the sativa offerings you know that's true w would you ever want to focus on doing like a sativa line or it's just not really your passion oh no no i i definitely would they're just i mean indicas are way easier <laughs> than yeah. they are that's for damn sure yeah, yeah the the time constraints makes it hard doesn't it yeah I'm I'm definitely trying to cross kind of uh going back. Um you asked about uh Tom's Hayes and um I'm I'm entertaining some uh you know uh some of the kind of how they built Hayes, right? Um, you know, hybridizing, you know, different sativas all together, you know. So I mean, you know, cross the Burmese with, you know, uh, a Colombian with a, you know, a Mexican with a, you know, so on and so on. I mean, if, if you start making, you know, good selections of each one and then, you know, you know, combining them and then, you know, I, I can even, you know, combine those, uh, you using feminized techniques, which you would really speed things along and, you know, kind of, you know, get to a finished product a lot sooner than if you're just doing reg braiding once a year type of thing. Yeah. We we got a, a, a good um, fan submitted question, which was they were saying, are there any Mexican varieties that uh, stand out to you that you would consider to be some of the better ones? Because I think there is a growing movement of people who are realizing that Colombians, Mexicans, maybe some of these were the real unsung heroes of like the land race sativas because you just mostly hear about Thai and Southeast Asia, but Colombians right. got a big following. Yeah, I mean, any of the older ones, you know, I, I wouldn't, I personally wouldn't trust anything, you know, uh, that's, that's come up in the last 20, 20 plus years. 
but you know the older Oaxacans, Mitchell Cons, you know all that kind of stuff. Um, anybody who's preserved, you know, uh, lines that came came out because anything that's really I'm I'm talking maybe 25, 30 years, anything that's come from Mexico since then has a good good chance of being you know contaminated with you know modern Amsterdam genetics, whatever, whatever, you know. I mean, and, and that's the same to be said anywhere where land races come from. I mean, I don't think you could go to Afghanistan or Pakistan or anything without running across a bunch of DNA genetic <laughs> contamination. <laughs> of course. I like the pun as well. DNA genetic contamination. That's good. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Aryan. It wasn't a purposeful pun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, it, while we're on the topic, I would love to ask, you know, how do you go about sourcing this material? Like if someone messages you and says, hey, I got this killer old stuff, like do you have to sort of approach that with an element of suspicion or do you have like a set way you go about vouching stuff? What's your process? I mean, m- most of the stuff I've, you know, worked with is, you know, all either older stuff or, you know, you can kind of... uh you can kind of vet where it came from, you know, follow the trail back. Um, you know, if, if somebody's like, I just got it from my cousin, you know, last year, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, well, uh, you know, <laughs> might not be the best source. Yeah. But, uh, you know, in, in, in the land race community, you know, uh, a, a lot of them, a lot of folks in it, you know, tend to, you know, trace, trace things back, you know, pr- pretty well. So, and then bottom line is, you know, uh, I always grow, you know, grow these things out beforehand. And if I like them, I'll use them. But if it's uh, there, there's been plenty, like I I grew out a a purple Yarkon line, uh, years ago and it was absolutely horrible and tons of people are talking it up, but man, uh -uh. I didn't even make one seat of that. Thank you. (laughs) yeah so you know wow that i mean just to quickly you know wrap up that tr- school of thought with the land races do you think we're quickly slash have already got to a point where land races essentially will only exist in people's seed catalogs and like they're not really indigenous to places anymore oh yeah i mean there there might be little tiny pockets here and there but i mean uh Land races generally stem from areas where a decent amount of people were, you know, growing, you know, for some kind of commercial, you know, right reasons. And that's, you know, why they have seeds. That's why, you know, seeds became available one way or another. So, but now, you know, there's either not that happening or, you know, I don't, I don't see a whole lot of people, you know, keeping things going, you know, outside of little tiny niche pockets, you know. Yeah, look, it makes sense. And it's certainly a bit concerning. I, I have to sort of hope that in the next 20 so years, like people realize what's going on. And especially when you see Thailand opening the floodgates mm. to cookies, it's like, I don't think they're going right? to be growing Thailand races. <laughs> No, they're not. Uh, 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 uh. Well, yeah. Well, okay. Well, while we're on the topic of old school stuff that's been preserved, I know you've got the Kush 4 cutting, which is one that you really don't hear mentioned very much. What can you tell us about it? Or you you could say I had the Kush 4 cutting. (laughs) (laughs) That one fell through the crack. Uh, It was a, it was a cool plant. It was a cool plant. Um, I don't know if I can't remember how, if I'm supposed to talk about that or not. Um, I, I, I got that through Bodhi. Maybe, maybe I'll hit Bodhi up and be like, can I talk about that? <laughs> you can censor it. <laughs> but uh, I, got, I got that through Bodhi and he got it directly from Jim Ortega. Right. And um, one, one of the stories was uh, the Hindu Kush. Um, you know, that was available back in the day was Kush 4 crossed with 
uh, Norm Lights 2, right? Which was the cushiest of the Norm Lights. Um, so, I mean, you know, it, it, it's a nice plant, um, you know, has a nice incense terp. Um, it smells very Bubba-esque on a different structured uh, style of a plant. Um, but, you know, um, past, past, you know, it coming from Jim Ortega, um, I don't know a whole lot about it. Yeah, that look. That's that's the story I'd heard from Bodhi that it was like one of the parents' scents he used, and it's meant to be really good. So that that all kind of checks out. I know you did some hybrids with it, with like the T one thousand. Have you had a chance to see how any of those have turned out, or you just got your plate full already? No, no. I I, I ran a I ran a couple of the Kush four hybrids out. Um, definitely the T one thousands, and uh, they they were good. Um. They they weren't as terpy as you know. I mean, j- just like we've talked, you know, there's one, two, three different things that everybody wants, and you know, everything else, you know, people are like, eh, and and so it kind of falls into that category. It, it it made some beautiful flowers. They smelled good, blah blah blah. But yeah, they weren't that over the top terpy. So you know, kind of to the wayside. Yeah, that that is interesting how you talk about it. You know, like there's things we want, there's things other people want. If you mm. if you were just left to your own devices and could pursue just purely passion projects, you know, you you win the lotto, and so now you're just breeding for just shits and giggles. It's what you want to do. What sort of stuff would you be focusing on? Hmm. Huh. Maybe I should start thinking about that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I always. Um, I think I'm kind of already doing that. Um, but, uh, I don't know. Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> I, I love the answer, man, that you, you live in the dream already. You're pursuing the passion. That, <laughs> it, it's a good answer, right? Because I tell people, a lot of people have this sort of dire straits view of the modern breeding landscape. And they say, you know, how am I meant to establish myself? Everything's the same. And I sort of allude to what you just said. It's like pursue what you're interested in. If you're interested in it, people will probably be interested in it. Right, right. I mean, uh, honestly, you know, uh, stuff that was just purely uh, passion was, you know, playing around with the ABCs. I mean, uh, surprisingly enough, there wasn't barely a single dollar in in the ABCs. So, uh, yes, uh, I, I had a lot of fun with those. And I'd like to revisit them too, you know. Um, but yeah, it, it it definitely has to be just all passion. Um, I like those weirdo plants, and I'd love to be able to <laughs> make one of those weirdos actually, you know, uh, a decent quality as well. Yeah, um, definitely. That that's cool, and uh, we'll have to touch base next time we chat how it's going for you. So there you have it, friends. What do you think? Another cracker. As usual, a massive, massive shout out to Caleb for taking the time to come join us today. We're incredibly grateful to both him and for everyone who's made it this far into the episode. Please go check out his incredible work. You will not be disappointed. All of the CSI crosses are fire. As always, we want to give a massive shout out to our sponsors who you will equally not be disappointed with. Seeds here now, number one seed bank in the industry, a guarantee on satisfaction, not just germination. Check them out, guys. You will not be disappointed. All the coolest breeders, the hottest drops, everything you could want and more under one roof. Seeds here now. We appreciate you so, so much. Likewise, Copet Biologicals, we love your pest and predation technology. Please, guys, don't wait until you have an active infection to release some beneficials into your garden. Do it now. Stay on top. Have peace of mind knowing that your garden is happy, healthy, pumping on all cylinders. Huge shout-out to Copet Biological Systems. Likewise, a huge shout-out to Pulse Sensors. If you're looking to keep your room dialed in, you need to go no further. 
from BPD to PPF to all the other measurements under the sun, they got you covered. And with the introduction of the latest Pulse Hub, you know you can integrate all of your information into one centralized unit. Whether you got a single tent, a single room, a single building, a multi-state operation, it's time to get serious, guys. Increase resin, yield, flavor, potency. Get serious, get a Pulse. Huge shout out to Organics Alive. You want to be giving your plants the best nutrition available. And you know me, I'm an organic guy. So it's no surprise that I am stoked to have Organics Alive on board. Products ranging from veg to transition to flower. Any problem you're in, they've got a product specifically designed to help you out. Don't just take my word for it. Check them out online, guys. There have been sweeping cups all around the country from home growers like yourself winning incredible cups. There's never been a better time to get on board Organics, guys. Check out Organics Alive. Massive shout out. We appreciate you as always. And a massive thank you to our newest sponsor, Dynavac. If you're looking to get off combustion and give vaping a go, I highly recommend you check out Dynavac. They have small, discrete units, easily accessible both in price and convenience with hits that replicate bongs and joints. I cannot emphasize this enough, guys. If you're thinking that you want to get off combustion, please consider Dynavap. I truly believe in this company. They produce phenomenal products that will give you a hit unlike any vape you've ever tried before. Massive shout out and thank you to Dynavap. We appreciate you greatly. And that's about it for this one, my friends. Looking forward to seeing you for part two. We'll see you.